Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. You're in for a treat because I'm going to be reviewing a teenage coming of age comedy that came out on August 14, 1999. What do you know? 20 years ago already. <laughs> yes, you're all waiting for this. I'm going to be reviewing that's the movie that's considered to be an underrated cult classic Detroit Rock City okay <laughs> I know I'm just trying to be like uh, <laughs> Gene Simmons right there as yeah, the demon you yeah, know always uh, sticking out his tongue his long ass tongue and <laughs> okay yes um, a story about four teenage guys who are trying to meet, who are big fans of KISS. You have four members, including Gene Simmons. And they're about to head out to Detroit, Michigan to see their idols in concert. Because they actually won four tickets. But then trouble lies ahead here and there. Yeah. I just bought the DVD a long time ago. I actually got this at uh, Barnes & Noble. Yeah, I mean, I know it comes in a blockbuster case, but actually, I put that case in there. <laughs> With this uh, disc concluded, yeah. Love this cover art, too, that they put in. So you just see the four guys getting chased down by these dogs. And, uh, and of course, this awesome uh, poster that was actually created by... Bill Roberts, yeah, created this design. It gives it a 70s uh, nostalgia feel to it. I really love that. I mean, come on, I mean, this has got to be awesome. I mean, a poster like this really, oh boy, it really <laughs> drives you wild. It just keeps on shouting. You just want to walk and roll all night and party every day. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is the New Line Platinum Series. Yeah, has tons of features right here. Well, either way, you get like 5.1 Dolby Digital Audio, free multiple angle features, which is Detroit Rock City performed by KISS themselves. They have their direct their own video with four concert angles to choose from. So, whatever angle that you want to see, you'll be able to view it. You also got the the film's high school band Mystery. Yeah, that's their tribute band that the four guys created by playing all the Kiss songs such as Rock and Roll All Night. And you even get to see their live recording sessions too. The extended confession scene. Um, and then they have a rare look of the actors' auditions. So that's cool. They got more than 15 minutes of deleted scenes that's awesome even has um, the song express um, which basically gets to learn how to play the song rock and roll on night a teacher who, who tells you to learn all the beats so you can play the song for your guitar yeah, love that free feature length commentaries yes you get all four of the original members of KISS you know, doing their own commentaries. I love that. You got Adam Ricken, the director of this movie, to do his own commentary. Awesome. And, best of all, the cast and crew group commentary joining in. So you'll get to hear Edward Furlong, along with um, Giuseppe Andrews, Sam Huntington, uh, James DeBello, and all the rest. Here and there. So it's probably their riff track or so. You get two music videos from the soundtrack, which is at this rate it's the Donnas and Everclear. Um, and then it comes with DVD ROM features, which has a script to screen, yeah, where you get to watch the entire script while watching the movie. It has the entire website on a DVD and a whole lot more. Well, that's what you get. <laughs> if you have this DVD. They do have this on Blu-ray where they just ported all the features 
The only thing they, they did not put out was, well, this guide at the back. <laughs> so, which has like a, just a short uh, slideshow that they put, which you can see at the end of the movie if you watch it. Or you just go straight to the menu. You know, just rewind. Yeah, I mean, New Line has been known for doing a lot of uh, awesome uh, DVD menus. So you get to access to all, all the uh, options you, you get to choose while watching your movie. Yeah, I mean, especially the indie film that they had later on. But they, they did the same with other uh, DVDs too, for other studios. Yeah, so before Blu-rays and 4K Ultra HDs, and this was like still in the the era for, for Laserdisc, yeah, before they were about to close, well, this is a better way to actually access them. <laughs> so that's cool. So this is an awesome set. And I'm glad. And of course, the main reason why I switched it uh, using the Blockbuster case was because it came in an Eagle Box case when I got it at Barnes & Noble and it got damaged, so I had to replace it. And it really holds very well, too. <laughs> okay. Now, the first time I saw Detroit Rock City, I remember seeing trailers of this film when I went to go see all these other summer blockbusters uh, back in 1999. And seeing that, um, well, one of my families, well, at this rate, my own mom, as well as my own uncle, are huge KISS fans. Yes. In fact, uh, they started collecting 8-tracks, vinyl records, cassettes, and yes, even CDs. And I, I started to listen to her songs, um, well, every time they play it, even on the radio, too. I mean, they started playing all these awesome songs, uh, such as Rock and Roll All Night, as well as um, Shout It Out Loud, God Gave Rock and Roll to You, or many others. I mean, wow. <laughs> and, of course, Gene Simmons would later become an actor with films like Runaway. Yeah, he played the villain in that. And he appears in films like Trick or Treat, which is a rock and roll horror film. Yeah, which also had uh, Ozzy Osbourne. So it's a lot of... So you get a lot of heavy metal uh, bands these days, you know, going really big. I mean, yeah, I mean... Because, you know, I, I do like some heavy metal rock... Because, you know, I do love heavy metal... Uh, rock music. I mean, I love classic rock and all that. You know, with ACDC, Kiss, of course, um, Black Sabbath, and Ozzy Os which, of course, Ozzy Osbourne and all the rest. So, I know <laughs> all these uh, all these religious groups are all say it's just basically devil's music. So, yeah, they're the ones who are going around attacking them. I mean, Ridiculous. Which apparently that's depicted in this film right there, so we're going to get to it. And anyway, the first time I saw this movie, I went to go see this at Man Criterion Theater in Santa Monica, which is at the Third Street Promenade. It's a big mall, but it's but it's on the street, so so pedestrians go around and across the street here and there. It's like. Uh, it's kind of like the Americana brand, or, or in some cases, um, the Grove, or, or any other um, pedestrian type of uh, malls that you see. I mean, you get a lot of shops, restaurants, movie theaters, you name it. I mean, that's where we went to see it. Um, it was actually across the street where AMC is, and, and on the other corner you see uh, Cineplex Odeon and all the other ones. Uh, that theater has been shut down. It became like a store already. But uh, at the time, uh, it, they were going through under renovation. I mean, the theater actually opened in 1990, even though it was originally a single screen theater before it became a, a multiplex for, for man theaters. So, yeah. So, anyway, I, I saw this on the big screen in THX surround sound. It was incredibly loud. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I felt like I was in a concert. 
when I saw this movie in theaters. I mean, I was like jumping out of my seat whenever they get to those uh, scenes. So, yeah, especially at the beginning. I mean, I was like, wow. I mean, I, I had a blast when I saw this. And it's really sad that this movie had flopped big time in theaters uh, when it came out. In fact, for a $17 million budget, it, it only made $5.8 million. Ouch. I know, that, that really fucking sucks. I mean, I felt the same way with some of the movies I've seen in theaters that didn't do very well at the box office. I think it's because of the summer blockbuster films that were getting in the way, and that's why this film didn't do so well. And that's true, because The Sixth Sense was a big hit, and so was uh, The Blair Witch Project, and I know films like American Pie was already becoming the hugely successful for a teen comedy. Then you got Awesome Powers, and Star Wars uh, Episode One: The Phantom Menace was, was going pretty strong, I mean... See, that's the problem. We have all these successful films coming out. This is why films like this gets um, shuttered down, and that's a shame. I mean, this this actually plays like a tribute to 70s nostalgia, yet alone Kiss, because Kiss was still popular even during that era. I mean, yes, I mean, they were still performing at the time. And on top of that, because I also remember seeing the short... Uh, Actually, now uh, film that they put in uh, before Good Burger, because that's where we got to see Kiss on there. Um, well, yes, <laughs> we know that. Um, they were putting out a lot of um, '70s um, nostalgic type of films, such as uh, Days and Confuse. Yeah, that was a very popular film of them all, directed by Richard Lynn later. Then we had a film like Stone Age, which I didn't care for, but I know it's trying to be like Days and Confuse, but that one's a tremendous bore. Plus, we also got that 70s show, came out uh, a year before this. So at this rate, they were filming this uh, while the show, or probably, uh, I think before, or maybe in the middle of it, uh, came out. and. Yeah, they were really getting into it, so they're getting into the groove, you know, going, focusing on disco and, and heavy metal rock, you know, going for that debate here and there, I mean, that, that sort of thing. And of course, we had a lot of popular shows in the 70s, too, like, mostly the Norman Lear shows, like, uh, like, All in the Family, Good Times, The Jeffersons, and then we had other shows like, uh, Happy Days, um, Mork and Mindy, uh, all of that. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, they had the latest fashions, too, at the time, like Bell Bottoms, uh, Day Glow, Lava Lamps. Uh, I mean, trust me, this is like one of the biggest generations of its time. But you also get uh, the new Hollywood, too, with uh, all, your, all these uh, legendary directors like Spielberg, Scorsese, Coppola, De Palma, and um, yes, uh, even the even Batam, and you get actors like John Travolta, Robert De Niro, uh, Joe Pesci, and Al Pacino, and <laughs> Diane Keaton, and then you get it, and then of course you get all these. Uh, other Aaron Spelling shows like um, Charlie's Angels and all the rest that you get, you know. I mean, it's it's cool, you know. That's what I love about it. Even though I was not born in the '70s, I mean, granted though, uh, my parents were like teenagers at the time, so I was only born in 1985, so they were in their 20s. So there you go. Okay, enough with the talk. I mean, let's get to the film. It stars Edward Furlong from Terminator 2 Judgment Day as well as Pet Cemetery 2. Sam Huntington from Jungle the Jungle. You yeah, remember that guy who played uh, Tim Allen's character's son, which happens to be a remake of Little Indian Big City. Giuseppe Andrews from Independence Day. I definitely remember him. James DiBello. 
totally hilarious in this film, and he's the best part of the entire film. Uh, Lynn Shea, you know, from the original A Nightmare on Elm Street, when he played the teacher, and she wants up in uh, all the the Fairly Brothers films, like Dumb and Dumber, Kingpin, and There's Something About Mary, and of course she's now in all these uh, Insidious films. Yeah, that's her. Uh, Melanie uh, Linsky, for those who don't know, she was uh, one of the uh, stepsisters in the movie Ever After a Cinderella Story. Yes, that's her. She's the nicest one, overweight, and because she loves to eat food and everything. Um, she's a New Zealand actress. Natasha Leon, who was in the movie uh, Slums of uh, Beverly Hills. She was also in Krippendorf's Tribe. And later she wants up in films like But I Am a Cheerleader, so on and so forth, and even the, that recent Netflix series. Uh, well, I don't remember the title at the moment, but you get the idea. Emmanuel Waki, yes, before she went on to do the movie Snow Day. Yeah, she played the diver. And then later she wants up uh, doing the voice of Chitara in the Thundercats uh, reboot from 2011. Yeah, which was short-lived, sadly, and I wish it lasted more. Because now we're stuck with, uh, well, I don't know if that even did came out, but a cartoon never did put out another reboot. And it looks really horrible, so that sucks. Shannon Treat, yes, she's, of course, um, Gene Simmons' wife. But I know she's been in a lot of films. She was a uh, Playboy model. Um, Nick Scotty, David uh, Quinn. Joe Flaggerty, yes, Joe Flaggerty from SCTV, a cast member, who went on to do a lot of stuff too. In fact, he was even in the, the TV series Freaks of Geeks the same year that this film came out. Play the fodder. Matthew J. Taylor, yes, who would later went on to play Nemesis in Resident Evil Apocalypse. Yes, so you'll recognize him. Ron Jeremy, yes, Ron Jeremy. The, the famous uh, porno uh, director and star and and yes he does a lot of the, all these porn films but he's very hilarious Nina Scololi and of course Kiss with Gene Simmons Paul Stanley Peter Chris and Ace Freely yes the demon the star child the Catman and the Spaceman all together in this awesome comedy right there. <laughs> okay. It's written by Carl B. Dupree. Yes, because he's a KISS fan himself. In fact, everyone else who's working in this film are KISS fans. So, there you go. And it's directed by another KISS fan out there, Anna Rickon, who gave us films like The Dark Backward, yeah, with Judd Nelson and Bill Paxton, God rest his soul, Laura, uh, Laura Friend Boyle, as well as the movie The Chase with Charlie Sheen, Chrissy Swanson, and many others that, that follow in that film. Yes, that's him. And then he went on to do the movie Look, which eventually became a TV series, short-lived. Yeah, about... Uh, what's happening uh, behind uh, the surveillance cameras. Yeah, that's the movie. The movie begins set in Cleveland, Ohio in 1978. We meet four teenage boys who are rebellious. Hawk, Lex, Trip, and Jam, real name Jeremiah, all played by Eric Furlong, Giuseppe Andrews, James DeBello, and Sam Huntington. They're about to run their own tribute band called Mystery. So this is where they get to sing all their KISS songs, because that's their favorite idol. Not only that, but oh, they actually have tickets to go see their favorite band in concert, which is the Coliseum in Detroit, Michigan. Well, they actually did film it in Toronto, Ontario, but you get the idea. So hoping that this was going to follow their dreams to finally get to meet their idols for the first time. But, 
trouble suddenly uh, lies ahead when Jan's uh, mom, who's a complete uh, religious nut, conservative and a total bitch, yeah, Mrs. Uh, Bruce, who's played by Lynn Shea, uh, well, what happened was um, she was about to pick up uh, Jam because she actually found the, the Kiss uh, vinyl record just when uh, she was about to play The Carpenters, you know, while you know, reading her book and drinking some wine, but then it splashes all over her when, when the music got incredibly loud. I mean, this is how I jumped out of my seat when this happened. It was pretty loud. Yeah, and she tried to find a way to turn it off, but I <laughs> know. So, because it's obviously she doesn't know how to turn it off, which there's a stop button right there. God, she was pretty dumb. But she had to try to unplug it, no use. But then she had to shake it off before it finally shuts off and takes out the record. And that's when she found out that it, it was a KISS record. And she was about to throw it in the trash and decided to take uh, Jam straight back home. Which then the following day, you know, he woke up, you know, already getting stuck. One of those exercise uh, stream machines here and all that. And he was about to grab the phone, but that hit him. His friends uh, were calling him up to find out if, that their tickets were missing, but it turns out that, yes, uh, Jam actually has them in his jacket. But then Mrs. Bruce came around and telling him to change his way, try to move on and stop listening to heavy metal music like Kiss. Giving him some clothes that, he, that she bought at Kmart. I mean, he almost tried to grab the tickets from the jacket, but it was no use because he was powerless to stop it. So then um, they find a plan to actually try to get the tickets back, but then Mrs. Bruce suddenly found out by finding those concert tickets and and actually burned them all just after she ex she actually uh, called directly through the principal's office. Yeah, she burns them all with her cigarettes right in front of him and the rest of his friends. And then Jam had to be transferred to Catholic boarding school. So that sucks. So now um, Trip, Hulk, and Lex were trying to form a plan to find a way to win the tickets once they were stuck inside by one of these um, radio um, classes where they had to build a radio and all that. So then they begin to listen to uh, a radio caller, so hoping that Trip will go all the way straight into the phone booth, and so he'll be able to call the number from the radio station to win the tickets, which we're going to lead to um, once we get towards it on, on the story. So now he had to say the uh, the right answers in order for him to win those tickets. So now he finally did. All three of them are going to try to find a way to get jammed back and to be able to cut school only to be chased down by a security guard named <laughs> Elvis uh, which actually had a very funny scene in the movie where they were about to hide straight into the uh, the girls uh, bathroom going straight into the bathroom stalls and because hoping that would be the closest clear that is until uh, uh, Lex's um, old crush uh, just went inside and yeah they were all hiding in into one stall but then the the toilet seat uh, broke down and then all these bathroom stalls fall all the way down and then the doors <laughs> closes like like a domino and then they escape and yes and she was screaming <laughs> while she was in the toilet and yes I know they even heard all all the farting noises and stuff. Yeah, her taking a shit and all that <laughs> so, okay so they finally uh, rescue um, Jam from the boarding school while they tr they were tricking the, the uh, father Philip McNulty who's played by Joe Flaggerty which they actually drugged them by adding the uh, hallucinogens uh, mushrooms inside the pizza yeah, father actually ordered uh, pizza from Pizza Pig, and this is where they they tricked him into it. So that way, uh, 
they could finally rescue him and be able to go on their way to Detroit. All of a sudden, they get into a world rage incident with disco fanatics, yeah, Kenny and Bobby, joining in with uh, Barbara and Christine, and they're all played by Nick Scotty, David Coyne, uh, Emmanuel Waki, and Natasha Leon. <laughs> yeah, so what happened was, because um, they only had the last piece left while they're on their way, um, Trip accidentally just threw uh, that pe the last piece of pizza and went, which actually went straight into the windshield of their car. So now, so they got into a fight. Yeah, Kenny took Hawk and just took him straight into the windshield and clean it, clean all that pizza mess over his uh, head. Yeah, all covered in it, and then then later uh, he he kicks him in the nuts and the head and starts to take the car you know adding a rock and just put in there into high gear and just and it drove all the way all the way down into the the overpass of the, the freeway they actually locked uh, Barbara along with Kenny and Bobby together and yes guess what they do they actually put in all the uh, the kiss makeup all around them <laughs> But Christine uh, already walked away. Uh, they were about to drive back on the road until they suddenly pick up Christine. Well, they thought this would be a good idea. And yes, it was a joke where there's, which I know you saw in the TV spots, the trailers were, when they found a chick uh, on the road, they said, well, they make scary movies like that. But hey, they make porno movies like that too. <laughs> yeah, when the... <laughs> <laughs> when Jam and, and Trip were chatting around. So they picked them up and they were just, you know, going around, you know, smoking some pot and you know, smoking some weed and you know, then they're just chatting around about disco and rock and all this other stuff. Just when they're finally on their way to Detroit. And once they were there, they were just getting ready to actually go straight to the uh, radio station just so they can get the tickets. And once uh, they find out who the caller was, which is Trip, that's when they found out, and this is the big one, they found out that the tickets had been sent to another caller just when he accidentally hanged up the phone. Yeah. So now four of them had to try to find a way to get the tickets by, you know, walking around separately to different locations to see if maybe they can make more money to get them if they could like uh, for example Hawk had to go to a a local strip club so that way he'll be able to strip in order for him to get more money but he has to also make it out with uh, that uh, hot chick named Amanda Finch played by Shannon Treat yeah and, and that scene was just oh boy hilarious which yeah, he suddenly drinks all that bourbon, and then he got all drunk. He actually vomited straight into the pitcher until he finally gets to do his uh, strip dance while they play the song, the, the Kiss song that they found. And because he also has the shirt and, and the, the underwear, which had the demon inside, and it says, Kiss that. And, oh, of course, you also got Ron Jeremy, uh, who's the... Uh, the strip club MC, yeah, he does come up with his own jokes and all that. That's really cool and refreshing. Yeah, that sort of thing. Then the next uh, trip went went into a local uh, convenience store. Yeah, maybe find someone out there who has uh, the Kiss tickets. He actually took uh, the uh, the Stretch Armstrong doll from those two kids. Yeah, one of them saying, "Kiss sucks," and then. Um, he actually went straight into the uh, Kiss uh, pinball machine. Well, that's where he meets that the kid, um, which eventually uh, had an older brother named Chongo, who's played by Matthew G. Taylor, who looks who looks almost like uh, Flash Gordon. You know, it was just weird. I mean, and I know that movie didn't came out until later. And I thought that was that actor too who played Flash Gordon, but no, it wasn't. It was uh, Michael J. Taylor. Yeah, he was very tall, strong, 
So I tried to make a deal with him, but that didn't work out until suddenly uh, a robbery was heading. And then suddenly there was a robbery that was going around. And this is where, you know, at first he was going to rob the store. But it turned out that it was another guy who was doing this. That's why he's starting to uh, stop the guy and try to... And he's just doing it, the, the KISS army. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, where's the ski cap underneath and just starts to find a way to stop the robber from you know killing the the store owner who's a, a teenage girl and then um, he tries to find a way to actually uh, take out the uh, stretch Armstrong down and, and he just and they both just took it out and stretched it while he was trying to grab the gun and and take it away from him and ready to shoot him and stuff and stop him so he did, he became the hero, everyone's safe, and then they just, then he got all the money for the reward to stop the guy, and then, which he had to pay, pay all the money to the kid and, and his brother, which, yes, was, yeah, he, he couldn't get the tickets, and then those two kids came back, took the stretch Armstrong Dow and all that, yeah, and threw a cupcake at him. Uh, Jam, on the other hand, was getting taken away uh, from his mom. Yes, yeah, because Mrs. Bruce uh, was right up there with all the rest of the cult. You know, they were against uh, KISS. Yeah, they formed their own organization. And they had to take uh, Jam straight into confession at, at the Catholic Church. Which, all of a sudden, um, Jam actually meets uh, a girl named uh, Beth Bumstein, played by Melanie Linsky, which they met before, and they met like a long time ago, ever since they were kids, and you know, for years, he was trying to find a way to get to know her, but he couldn't, because I know a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of slapstick going around, and so, well, there you go, <laughs> From through their confession, they, they actually made love. And they're trying to uh, confess uh, the priests about everything. And then, of course, um, Lex uh, just went um, straight into um, into the concert. You know, trying to pose himself as uh, one of the uh, the members who are about to take all the all the equipment, including that drums right there, which has the word "kiss" on it. But then he accidentally. Uh, well, he, he, knocked, he accidentally knocked it over, tripping through the wires, and it just hit straight into the speakers. And then he was being chased down by all these other members, and they went. He went all the way down into the uh, <laughs> the escalators and tried to escape until he wants up straight into the garbage, where that's where he's being chased down by all these dogs. Until yeah, like the the German Shepherd and and the Dobermans around. Until a basket hound came around with the frisbee, he froze it around. Yeah, I mean he's afraid of dogs, so he was trying to escape from them. Until he suddenly found out that since the bobo was uh, taken away, stolen by these uh, two um, mechanics, they actually trapped uh, Christine inside. So now uh, Lex finds a way to save her and get their bobo back by stopping these two mechanics. Yeah, with the dogs, and they escape, so. Well, no such luck. Uh, they couldn't get the tickets until Jam finally found a better solution to uh, beat themselves up, and they did. They beat themselves up, all that blood uh, coming around, and then that's when they suddenly went straight into um, the concert, and then they stopped the... Uh, the kid with his older brother uh, Chongo and and the rest of his friend his friends because they team up to kick them out so now that way they could finally get the tickets and now they finally get to see their favorite band of all time Kiss let's leave it that way yeah I know <laughs> dead giveaway but that's fine <laughs> I mean, it's been 20 years now, so. But, in my opinion, 
I thought the film was hilarious, fun, energetic, and and not only that, but it had a lot of great slapstick here and there and all this other crazy shit that's happening. And it almost pays a tribute to 70s nostalgia with the mix of, uh, of course, Kiss. So, and they even played a lot of uh, 70s uh, music joining in with the disco era and the rock era. So they, you get to hear like songs like uh, KC and the Sunshine Band, uh, David Bowie. You also get to hear um, Cheap Trick, uh, Band Halen, and and um, all the rest here and there. But but most of all, you can hear all the Kiss songs here. So that's cool. And yes, they did throw in the two songs, uh, mostly for the film, which a cover version of "The Boys Are Back in Town Again" by uh, Everclear and and Strutto by the Donnas. So yeah. So it's really cool, and I love the cast. Um, Eric Furlong was just downright uh, awesome as uh, as uh, Hawk. I mean, he comes a long way from playing John Connor, and there you go, he plays a whole different character. And you know that he loves uh, joining in with his awesome friends, uh, Lex, played by Giuseppe Andrews, uh, Tripp, who is, who's always been the best part of, of them all. In fact, he's also my favorite uh, out of the movie, because, uh, I mean, this guy is like crazy. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean... You know you love this guy. You know he wants, you want to have him part of it. He has long hair. He has a cap on, and you know he's just like, man. I mean, this is the perfect guy you want to have for your friend. And of course, uh, Jam, you know, played by uh, Sam Huntington. I mean, he's also very good too. I mean, coming from uh, Jungle to Jungle, I thought he really nailed it there. And Lin Shea was hilarious, granted, uh, you know, playing the the religious uh, conservative mom of jams, so, I mean, the fact that she smokes a lot with all these cigarettes and trying to teach him how to become like one of them, you know, trying to get away from all, trying to become like a normal boy, that sort of thing. Um, I, but I know, she was a bitch. Granted, I mean, you do want to hate this character, but but I guess that's the whole purpose of it. And she has some lovely uh, blonde hair too. Um, so it's like so she's like a uh, a grandmother in a way. Um, well, <laughs> I can't believe I'm describing that, but Lynn Shade's always been a great actress, no doubt about it. She's she's totally legendary. Um. And it's nice to see other actors joining in. I mean, like, it, it was great to see Natasha Leon and uh, Melody Linsky, uh, Linsky, uh, Shannon Treats, you know, Gene Simmons' wife, Emmanuel Baki in her earlier role before Snow Day and all the rest. Um, and it's nice to see Ron Jeremy in this. Uh, I know that Adam Ricken had a small bit cameo where which is basically a an ID uh, photo of uh, what's supposed to be uh, <laughs> yes um, Hawk which is just a fake ID but that's really him underneath the uh, the wig and the glasses and all that you I mean you gotta listen to his commentary where he explains all this stuff but yes out of reckon you know this is definitely uh, his best direction that he ever did for this film. I mean, I love the way, you know, he brought in the cinematographer, uh, John R. Linetti. Yes, for those who are familiar with, he's been working on cinematography for other films, including Mortal Kombat, which eventually he directed the sequel, which sucked. And yes, he did Wish Upon, but nevertheless, um, he is a very good cinematographer. Um, I love how he creates all these shots here and there, and um, with all these uh, fast-paced zoom-ins and you know and slow-paced stuff. I mean, yeah, slow-paced and fast-paced zoom-ins and all that. Sort of like in the style that um, Barry Sonnenfeld used to do too in his films, uh, with Mark uh, Goldblatt doing the editing. 
Yes, the same guy who had directed the movie The Punisher with um, with Dolph Lundgren and um, Louis Gossett Jr. Yeah, that movie. But he's also been a longtime editor for other films. Joins in with Peter uh, Shanik. I don't know if I said it right. Shahink, I think. Yeah, it was Shahink. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'm just, I'm just high on energy on this. Uh, but the writing was actually special. Yes, it's predictable. It's silly. I mean, but that's the whole point. I mean, it's not about kiss, as they said. It's, it's about four guys who want to see a kiss concert, and it, and they are their favorite bands, and it's nice to see them. And yes, for, for the surprise, I'm just glad that, you know, we're not disappointed to actually finally see them on stage uh, performing the song uh, Detroit Rock City, the, which is the title of the movie. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, wow, I feel like I really was in a KISS concert. Yeah. Because that was a blast. And I, I love that shot, too, the... Uh, the point of view shot inside uh, uh, Gene Simmons' uh, mouth, which you get to see the long tongue moving around. I, I, I really love how they put that shot in there. In fact, they actually did that for free. I'm surprised. But that's very clever. And of course, you do get to see uh, him uh, with all that blood coming out of his mouth, too. I mean, wow. And all this other stuff. I mean, I mean this is like... Oh yeah, and even the scene where Peter Chris um, just froze the uh, the drumstick, and suddenly <laughs> Jam actually catches it. Yeah, cause cause the other one was busted though. I mean, yeah, she busted it. Um, his mom busted it. So, but yet he got it, and awesome. Ah, <laughs> oh, wow. But it. Anyway, I mean, for those shots alone in the movie, it definitely has a 70s nostalgia feel to it. It looked like it was shot in the 70s, even though this is basically a 90s uh, movie that came out. I mean, it's a 70s, uh, it's a 70s movie, but filmed in the 90s. And, and let's put it this way. Um, so it has all the grain in there, and has all the reds, blacks, and all that in, in the mix, and all the 70s music being played, you know, all the, um, all the, uh, the, the style, the looks of it, they're all there, it's not, you don't see any of these, uh, 90s style, uh, mixes in there, you see all the cars and, and all these, uh, other nostalgic stuff, nostalgic things that they put in, so, it's all 70s right there, not, not even a 90s, uh, fad in, in, in sight. So, Adam is trying to do his best to make it historically accurate as possible. So, even if it isn't, uh, even if it had a few parts of flaws in there, but whatever. But all I could say was that, and I know I'm, I'm talking way too much on this, but I love this movie. It's such an underrated gem. It didn't deserve the flop at the box office. In fact, it deserved to, to be as higher as it can. It should have been successful. I mean, everybody know who Kiss were at that time I mean just pick this movie up if you haven't seen it I mean I know I know I know I give it away but who cares it's fun you're gonna love it but hey if you don't if let's put it this way if you're a fan of Kiss you'll love this if you're a fan of comedies you'll love this but if you don't like it then well hey <laughs> move on so that's Detroit Rock City, and I give the film five stars. It's perfect. I mean, it's not... For me, it is. So <laughs> Five stars is good enough for me. And it's my favorite. And a Rickon film. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye. And walk on. <laughs>